So the year is 931 BCE. That's at least 900 years before Jesus walked the earth. So David is long gone, and King Solomon has died as well. And his son, Rehoboam, has come into power. Now, at the time that Rehoboam comes into, the, into power, Jeroboam, I wish their names weren't so close, but this is going to happen all morning, so just be ready. Jeroboam, uh, who is a, a leader and a respected person in the northern part of the country, comes to him and says, you know, you're coming into power. Things are going great. There's peace and goodwill in the kingdom. Give the people a tax break. Well, at the same time, Rehoboam's advisors say, you know, your father was really, really a powerful, beloved king. You have to show the people that you are a strong, powerful king. You need to come down hard on the people. And that's the advice he follows. And the kingdom divides over this. Now, I've asked for a map up here, quick map. If you look carefully, you see Israel and Judah and a line between them. This is where the kingdom splits into two. The northern part is called Israel. The southern part is called Judah. So um, Jeroboam sets up as the king in Israel, and Samaria becomes the capital. And uh, let me get it right. Rehoboam becomes the uh, king in Judah, the southern part, and he rules from Jerusalem. Now, because of that, we know that it's the southern part of this divided nation that we're going to follow all the way in to the coming of Jesus. So just keep that in mind as we continue. Um, over the next few hundred years then, as this unfolds with the divided kingdom, both of these kingdoms have some really bad kings. Each of them has 20 terrible kings. Well, they're not all terrible. The worst of them, though, is Ahab. Ahab was a ruler in Israel in the north. You might know better his wife Jezebel. And through her, he brought the worship of Baal into the kingdom. And this was a serious problem that created great trouble, and the people began to lose their way in a significant fashion. So he was one of the bad kings. There were a few good kings. They all, the ones I'm mentioning, are in the southern part in Judah. There's Jehoshaphat, you know, jumping Jehoshaphat. Now, there's nothing in Scripture to support the jumping part. It seems to be just kind of a soft way of swearing. So, uh, something just in our, in our culture that emerged there. But Jehoshaphat is the king of Judah at a time when um, the northern country, when Israel, is being completely overwhelmed by Assyria. And Jehoshaphat trusts and follows God during this time, and Judah is spared from being overrun as well. So that's kind of his claim to fame. You might also remember the name Hezekiah and the name Josiah. These were other good kings of Judah who worked really hard to try to bring the people back to the ways of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But about 100 years after the northern part falls, so Israel falls to Assyria, Assyria. Assyria. About a hundred years later, Judah gets conquered by the Babylonians, and the leaders and the riches all end up in exile. It's their story, those who are exiled into Babylon, that story of the nation of Judah that we follow. We follow the line of David, the city of David, and the restoration of that city in the future. The northern nation, Israel, this is where it starts to get a little confusing. These people completely assimilate and dissipate, and they are referred to as the lost tribes of Israel. And it becomes Judah that carries the name Israel into the future as we would know it now. Confusing, I know, but still, that's how it plays out. So what we've had, bad kings, bad times for Israel and for Judah, and all of the people have been sent away. Now, God's been working through these troubled years, doing all that is possible to keep the people together. But what do you do when the kings themselves are part of the problem? Well, the answer that God had was to send prophets to warn the kings and to warn the people of where they were headed and what danger they were in. Sometimes they listened, like Jehoshaphat and Hezekiah and Josiah. Sometimes they absolutely did not, like Ahab. Always, though, the prophets were in some amount of danger because people didn't necessarily want to hear what they were telling. 
It's during this time of the prophets that two particular prophets, whose names we know well, rise at the command of God. One of these is Elijah, whom God sends to none other than Ahab and Jezebel to tell them of God's complete displeasure at the worship of Baal. God says through Elijah, I'm going to depart from you and I'm going to send no rain for a period of time. So Elijah warns the king and then goes out into hiding, first in the northern part of Israel and then all the way kind of off the map outside of Israel where a widow woman and her son take him in. And this is the setting for two of Elijah's very important miracles. One, the woman who had very little oil and very little flour when he first encountered her, during the time that Elijah stays in her home, neither the flour nor the oil ever run out to feed her, her son, Elijah, and their household. And the second miracle is more spectacular. The woman's son becomes gravely ill and dies, and Elijah brings him back to life. This is the first resurrection story in our scripture. Then Elijah is called upon by God to return to Ahab and challenge those priests of Baal to see if they can bring fire from the sky on a mountaintop. 350 of them try as hard as they can to bring fire onto that mountaintop, and they fail abysmally, and Elijah, with no small amount of drama and spectacular uh, effects, not only brings fire down, but all of those priests are destroyed in this rain of fire. And eventually, Elijah also brings one heck of a rainstorm that restores the land and marks the beginning of the end for Ahab and Jezebel. And it also marks a new page for Elijah, who during this time goes into hiding down in the southern kingdom, down in Judah. He's ministered to by angels, and he waits, and eventually, even though he has felt very alone and forgotten, he hears the voice of God, not in a fire, not in wind, not in an earthquake, but as a still, small voice, something we should remember when we are sometimes wondering where God is, is to quiet ourselves and listen. And in that still, small voice, God instructs Elijah to connect with Elisha. Couldn't be some name that was different, had to be Elisha. And he becomes servant, friend, and protege to Elijah for many years, and they become as close to each other as father and son. When the time comes for Elijah, the older of the two, to be taken up, and he doesn't die in Scripture, he is taken up to God. When that time comes, that scene is captured in 2 Kings chapter 2. Uh, Dr. Weshi and I are going to read that to you right now, and what I want you to realize is that everybody in the story knows what's happening, knows that Elijah is going to be taken up. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, and as you also live, I will not leave you. So they went on to Bethel. The company of prophets who lived there spoke with Elisha and said to him, do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said to them, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, You stay here, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went on to Jericho, where the company of prophets who lived there drew near to Elisha and spoke to him, saying, do you know that today the Lord will take your master from you? Elisha, Elisha answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. This happened a third time as Elijah headed to Jordan. Again, Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as you also live, I will not leave you. As they reached the Jordan River, some of the prophets followed them and watched from a distance. As Elijah takes his cloak, rolls it up, and strikes the water, the waters part, and the two men cross. When they reached the other side, Elijah asked Elisha, Tell me, what may I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha said, Please, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Elijah responded, 
you ask a hard thing, but if you see me go as I am taken from you, it will be granted. Now this is the point in the story when a chariot and horses of fire appear in the sky and they separate the two men from each other and Elijah, Elisha watches as Elijah is taken up in the chariot and the horses and they disappear into the sky and then he tears his clothes into in grief. He picks up Elijah's cloak that had fallen from him and he rolls it up and strikes the water as Elijah had done, striking the water and saying, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? The waters of the Jordan River part, and Elisha crosses over where he is greeted by the company of prophets who bow to the ground before him. And it is from that moment on that Elisha is known for his incredibly accurate prophecy and his great miracles. He's going to be the one that works with Jehoshaphat, that king in Judah, when the northern kingdom is being overrun by Assyria. He's going to be the prophet who works with Jehoshaphat to help protect the kingdom during that time. He will do much good in the name of the Lord God. But as we have been talking about all morning, within a hundred years, the people will again have turned away from God and will be hauled off into exile in Babylon. And we will look at those Babylon stories, some of them this next week. But what I want to focus on for just a few moments here is that beautiful scene when Elijah is taken up. He asks Elisha, tell me what I may do for you before I'm taken from you. This is their last moment together. And Elisha simply says, please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Beautiful. If you understand Hebrew culture, you know that the firstborn son always receives a double portion of the inheritance from the father. So this little exchange speaks volumes about how close these two men are. They are like father and son, and all Elisha wants for a double portion is that beautiful, God-filled, faith-filled spirit. He has stuck by Elisha's side, even though Elisha ha Elijah has encouraged him to stay behind. And it is out of love and respect and loyalty and faithfulness that he stays close to Elijah all the way to the very end. And that is rewarded. Elisha picks up his master's cloak and he strikes the water where Elijah has just done that moments before. And sure enough, the waters part, and that whole group of local prophets are there to witness Elisha receiving the double portion of spirit. I'm very moved by this scene from Scripture. It leaves me thinking about our saints, all those persons we have named today, aloud and in our hearts, with candles and with little name badges. I would venture that every single one of them has given us a double portion of of something, something that has formed us for this exact moment in life. Mixed in with trials and struggle, struggles and failures to be perfect of them and of us, rise things that have brought us literally here, right now in this place, if you think about it. Our saints, our beautiful, beloved, complicated, less than perfect saints, are part of how we have arrived here today exactly who we are and that is wonderful that is beautiful that is sacred in no small way it is the life of jesus who brings us here today we know this and we know the other saints like those early disciples like the saints of history like our own john wesley have brought us here today so i invite you to gather them in with all of those you have lost in your life and picture them around you and with you right now in this place. I think sometimes that veil between life and death is very, very thin indeed. And I want us to take just a few moments to simply be grateful for those who came before us whose lives have intertwined across centuries and years and months and days, bringing us here to this moment, gathered together in the love of God. Amen.